Hello, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Are we live? Hey. Okay, hi everyone. So we are going to start. Um, we'll start first with a short um, introduction um, by the chair, McLean Clutter. Um, and then we will um, do a kind of digital walkthrough and show us, show you some of the work that we've been working on. So um, let's get McLean on here. I'm here. All right. Hello. We good? Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, hello, everyone out there. Um, welcome to the very first all virtual Talbot College Fellowship presentation and exhibition opening. Uh, I'm McLean Clutter, the chair of the architecture program here at Talbot College. Uh, and I'm really delighted to be giving this in introduction uh, and to have the opportunity to introduce the work of the fellows despite the context. Um, so those of us who have been uh, at the college at Taubman for quite a while uh, know that one recurrent characteristic of our fellows is that they have the ability to complete projects with a kind of richness, uh, level of consideration, and intellectual depth that seem like they could have taken years to pull off all within the context of one year. Uh, so it probably shouldn't be a surprise that with the onslaught of the coronavirus pandemic, Eduardo, Eduardo, Jacob, and Mattis were able to turn on a dime to reconceptualize their fellowship exhibition opening, and then to reconceptualize it a second time as the situation continued to develop uh, and to still deliver this event tonight in a pretty impressive fashion. So on behalf of the architecture program, I wanna start by thanking them. I think we, uh, we need this kind of thing right now more than ever, uh, and you guys have made the college proud. So the fellowships at Talman College are among our most cherished traditions. Every year for more than 30 years now, we've brought in a set of some of the most talented young architects, designers, and scholars to teach uh, and pursue a one-year project within the context of our school. Uh, there are more than 100 alumni of our fellowships spread all over the country and the world. And some are among the most accomplished architects, designers, and thought leaders in our fields. And of course, many are now tenured or tenure track faculty here at Taubman. I think the fellows are absolutely essential to the ecology of the architecture program here, to kind of sustaining the dynamism and experimental spirit that I think defines us at our best. While the fellows are amongst the most junior of our faculty, uh, at the same time, and perhaps in a bit of a strange way, I've always viewed them as kinds of leaders of the faculty. We look to the fellows to guide us towards new ideas and methods, to keep us fresh, to challenge us, and to cause us to question habits of thought that may have become too routinized or automatic. And while we as a college take the responsibility of mentoring our fellows very seriously, I think we also learn uh, and expand our breadth and depth of knowledge from their presence. So just a few examples. Um, the first time I heard the word Anthropocene, it was from a fellow. I learned to see the picturesque tradition and architecture anew from a fellow. I learned about Walmart, Walmart's territorializing command on urbanization from a fellow. I actually started to pay attention to, this, to the discursive capacities of Instagram and architecture culture because of a fellow. I learned about little known histories of computational aesthetics from a fellow. And this list could really go on and on. Um, I also had a former fellow as a professor. I worked for a former fellow and now I practice with a former fellow. Um, and I, my point here is I don't think my experience is unique. 
Taubman Fellows have been profoundly impactful on the work and thought of many of us in the college and in the discipline at large. I love that the work of our fellows, frankly, doesn't always make sense. Sometimes it's too close to our dis disciplinary threshold of known aesthetic tendencies or utterable thoughts to bother with sense on that level. It always makes sense later, uh, once the rest of us have kind of caught up, and once the fellows figure out what it is that they were working on when they made the work. And I love that we as an architecture program support that kind of experimentation and risk. I think it makes us unique as an institution. And I think that kind of venturing into the unknown is absolutely central to academic pursuit. And if Taubman Fellows so often direct us towards nascent topics and techniques, or those of emerging urgency, then these three this year seem no different. Um, given the context and format for tonight's event, uh, Jacob, Mattis, and Eduardo seem like nothing less than proverbial canaries in the coal mine. Skimming through their project statements, they ask us to think about things like architecture's entanglement with the immaterial, with digital interfaces and spreadsheets. Um, they discuss the convergence of places of work, life, and leisure. They throw caution at the precarity of free market capitalism. They allude to a condition of, quote, digital nomadism, a term that must resonate with so many of us who have found ourselves wandering through various formats of remote digital collaboration and work for these past couple of weeks. And there are more tropes like this that I'm sure that they will unpack in much more detail for you. But to be clear, the present uh, crisis is not the topic of these fellows' projects but it's certainly revealing of the relevance of our work that our response to the crisis brings so many of their key concepts into sharp relief. So I won't be a spoiler. I'll, I'll leave the, the content stuff there, but I'll conclude just by introducing the fellows uh, in the order that they'll present, and then I'll hand it over to them. So first, um, we'll hear from Mattis Gross Kaufmanis. He is our Sanders Fellow here at Thomas College. His research and design work examines architecture's relationship to political and economic ideologies with a focus on the emergence of global architecture practice. In 2018, he served as a curator of the Latvian Pavilion uh, at the Venice Architectural Biennale, exploring housing as a means of nation building. Uh, he's an alum of the Stroka Institute for Media, Architecture, and Design in Moscow. Uh, and also he will, holds a master's degree from Delft University of Technology and a bachelor's degree from the Glasgow School of Art. And prior to uh, founding his architecture agency Schema in 2019, Chris Kaufmanis worked on research, publishing, and building projects uh, as part of the practices OMA and MBRDB. Next, we'll hear from Jacob Kmerci. Uh, Jacob is a designer and educator, and he's this year's William Muschenheim Fellow here at Taubman. Jacob received a Master's of Architecture from Princeton University and a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, while at Princeton, he was awarded the Howard Crosby Butler Traveling Fellowship, where he studied building groups in Berlin, as well as the Suzanne Kollerich Underwood Thesis Prize for Excellence in Design. Uh, and he's worked for uh, offices like Bureau Spectacular in Chicago and Los Angeles, uh, and for Moss and LTL in New York. His research and design work considers models for collective life and work by way of the interior fit out of existing real estate with furniture scale domestic equipment. And then finally tonight, we'll hear from Eduardo Medeiro. Um, Eduardo is the inaugural Fishman Fellow here at Talman College, uh, a new fellowship named in recognition of our own Professor Robert Fishman, who I assume is uh, at home watching this right now. Um, Midiero is a licensed architect and founder of Hanger, uh, an architecture practice based in Madrid that works on the confluence of architectural precedents and financial organizational models. The practice develops projects from furniture, interior design, housing, and urbanism. Midiero holds a master's of architecture in, uh, with honors from the Polytechnic University of Madrid uh, and a master's of architecture from Harvard's GSD where he was the recipient of the 2018 KPF Traveling Fellowship. His work has been exhibited at the, at the 14th Biennial of Spanish Architecture and Urbanism, the 16th and 15th Venice Biennale, uh, the Colegio de Arquitectos de Madrid, and at Etsum. 
Mediero is the re recipient of the Real Colegio Complutense Fellowship and the Arthur Lehman Fund. So with that, um, maybe we can all clap to ourselves in whatever rooms that we're in right now and let's uh, welcome the Taubman Fellows, starting with Mattis. Um, well. Thank you, McLean. That was great. Uh, maybe maybe before um, Marius goes on the uh, a kind of over, overall uh, project description, we will have a few words that we want to say collectively. And we have kind of delegated that to Eduardo Medero to deliver. Yeah, and we are also going to be showing uh, a sort of video walkthrough of the of the space so that you guys can uh, can also uh, check that out. Cool. Um, should we wait for that? Just a second. Uh, so we we're gonna we actually managed to build an exhibition in in the real yeah. space, which unfortunately you could not see in IRL. Uh, but our plan is to show you a walkthrough and. Eduardo, uh, yeah, explain it. Sure. Um, well, first of all, we'd like to uh, also um, thank the Dean Massey and the Chairs of the Architecture and Urban Planning Department for their unconditional support. And of course, very specially to McLean Clutter for his help and enthusiasm from the, from the very beginning. We'd also like to thank our respective uh, fellowship selection committees for granting us this amazing opportunity. And to the faculty and staff of the Liberty Research Annex Gallery, which uh, you guys will see it here in the video, we're actually entering it uh, right now. Um, and uh, to Chris Humphrey, uh, whose assistance has been uh, incredible in the making of this exhibition, and uh, Sam Wood for a great visual identity and graphic design. And uh, maybe also remind everyone that we have a chat box and the YouTube link where you, where you all will be able to, um, to make comments or ask questions that we'll be able to answer um, after our talks. So what you're seeing here in this video is, um, is as Max was saying, the physical exhibition that is currently right now at the Liberty Research Annex Gallery and that we hope that some, we, you will be able to visit in person one day. Uh, and this exhibition that we titled um, Practice Product Protocol is an exhibition about architecture's entanglement with immaterial systems, as McLean was mentioning. So in the, um, in the era of the information economy, um, an increasing part of architectural discourse no longer responds to material assets, but rather to the value and opportunity of intangible ones, such as financial instruments, digital interfaces, spreadsheets, invoices, and diagrams. The emergence of abstract organizational structures has also led to the inability of establishing clear boundaries between traditional notions of public and private space. As domestic and working environments have converged into a single place of life, work, and leisure. Increasingly, these environments are mediated through corporate organizational platforms, um, allocating space as a subscription-based service. The entanglement of architecture with these immaterial systems is displayed in this uh, exhibition in three interspeared parts, ranging from a serially produced catalog of deployable soft architecture, a video game environment that examines organizational models of architecture practice, and financial formations for a post-property urban condition. So right now what we're seeing here is uh, uh, sort of the walkthrough of the video, um, and we'll let you guys sort of uh, check it out, see it virtually uh, before we before we start. Yeah, so as, as you see for this year, uh, with the great support of uh, McLean, we managed to kind of uh, uh, kind of try to uh, organize the exhibition in a space that is not part of the kind of uh, faculty uh, building, uh, but it's out outside of the building. And the idea was to kind of bring everyone uh just to another place and uh now because of the uh, a virus everyone else is kind of distributed uh, in in their homes uh, so that plan did not work um but nonetheless uh i, th I think it's, it's important to mention that we basically were, we were given uh 
uh, a lot of physical space to to fill uh, and also a lot of support in a way to, uh, to do that. So in, in this video, you are kind of seeing kind of yeah, the kind of gradual full walkthrough of everything that we have physically produced uh, over the last acad academic years. So you see a lot of uh, 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 furniture pieces, architectural models. Uh, uh, there's a, like a video game. There are actually two video games. Uh, one is uh, a, a well-known video game. Other one is not that well-known video game. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to talk about it uh, in, in a minute. Um, it's, it, this video was also kind of uh, filmed uh, during the daytime. So uh, the kind of original intention was to kind of also work on the lighting and to kind of uh, set the kind of set mood that uh, we could all collectively try to imagine what it could be. Um, but but the overall kind of uh, like like overarching theme of, of this space is just the kind of like a scattering of different objects in in more or less kind of a random uh, manner uh, uh, to basically produce like like a labyrinth of large scale uh, architectural models and yeah as you see in the video uh, that's pretty much uh, um, how it looks like. Jacob, you want to add something? Yeah, just that, well, to echo, echo, echo the thanks of um, to McLean for being very supportive throughout um, uh, in all the ways and just encouraging us the entire time. There was never a point when uh, in our musings that he discouraged us. So um, I can't thank him enough. Um, and also just the point that we were as a kind of we understood the fellowship not as three individual projects, although of course we all made individual things, but um, the practice product protocol idea, um, I would say, I mean, if I were to speak for these guys, um, as well as myself, that none of us um, identify with just one of those terms and that I think those um, terms will be present um, very, they'll be visibly present in the work that is that um that you'll see so um yeah no i don't have anything else to say um that's great so maybe we can <coughs> excuse me i wish you guys could see this i guess that's the other thing i would say i wish you guys could see but i'm glad that whoever the 150 something people that are here um are interested in seeing it Yeah, and here on this white wall, you you would ideally see a video game that was not projected that moment. Anyway, and that's the end of the walkthrough. So uh, our plan, as McLean kind of uh, indicated, is basically you can have like a sequence of three presentations. Uh, I'll start first, then uh, Jacob will uh, follow, and then it will be concluded by, uh, by Eduardo. After that, we're going to have a, a kind of a, a response, a discussion about our work by three faculty members who we invited to kind of look at our work and also to kind of maintain a discussion. However, uh, those who are watching this on YouTube, uh, I would invite you to uh, kind of prepare questions uh, and just uh, type them in the chat box. Uh, all three of us are monitoring the chat box. And in the end, we will try to kind of also organize, kind of, we will experiment with a Q&A uh, from YouTube to just try to answer maybe some questions that, that you might have uh, as well. Right. So uh, on, on, on that note, uh, I'll, I'll start with my project. So just a second. Right. All right, we are live. Um, okay, so uh, so uh, yeah, um, in basically my presentation consists of uh, two parts. Uh, I will start with a very brief kind of uh, overview of um, things that I've uh, looked at over the last uh, academic year uh, during my fellowship. Uh, uh, and then in the second half of my presentation, I will try to um, basically uh, kind of show uh, what, what are the things that are actually made uh, basically for the exhibition. Um, yeah, so there will be two parts. Uh, before I continue, there are two notes that, that I wish to kind of uh, 
uh, in a way, kind of uh, include it in, in my presentation. So uh, uh, one is that uh, to keep this live stream kind of lively and concise, I will glance at uh, many things that I would love to talk about more in another occasion. So uh, if you want to reach out to me and just like, I don't know, talk about these things, uh, let's do that. Um, Second thing is that uh, before I continue, I really need to thank uh, a significant amount of uh, people who, without whom this project and this fellowship would uh, never have happened. Uh, and in particular, um, I want to thank Emma McLean Clutter, uh, who, as I mentioned before, kind of gave us this kind of uh, unconditional support uh, for the fellowship, uh, which we really appreciate. Uh, this was kind of really kind of a uh, fresh sense of kind of uh, really kind of liberating conditions that, that uh, we were kind of uh, granted and, and, and that's really kind of uh, that's, that's something unique and, and I personally really appreciate that. Um, and, and also I wanted to thank McLean for this kind of continuous en encouragement uh, to kind of truly explore uh, things uh, in my work without the kind of obligation of being uh, intellectually accountable for what I've done uh, during the exhibition opening, uh, which is tonight. Um, I also want to thank the last year's fellowship uh, 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 committee for uh, choosing me. And I guess in particular also Sharon Har, who was uh, at that time head of the school who kind of uh, uh, hired me, but also more importantly, I got to work with Sharon and she kind of really kind of helped me to transition from practice to this kind of world of Tolman College during the first uh, months when we were teaching together. Um, and last but not least, uh, I really want to thank the students who kindly agreed to collaborate with me on this uh, project. Uh, Gary Zhang, uh, Lindsay Barranco, and Catherine Mallory. Uh, most of what you will see in the following uh, uh, slides, and both in the real kind of uh, gallery space, if you ever get to see it, uh, is a direct, direct result of their kind of dedication. And uh, it would not be there if, if they would not uh, kind of have decided to uh, help me. So I really appreciate that. Um, all right. So, um, practice product protocol. Uh, this is the name of our exhibition, and in a way, uh, we kind of uh, compiled this name uh, based on uh, our shared interests in the beginning of the kind of current academic year. Uh, in the beginning, they seem like three very different uh, interests, despite the, the fact that they all started with P. Um, but then gradually these uh, three topics kind of converged into a single uh, exhibition uh, uh, and, and kind of also more importantly a single ongoing discussion about architecture and uh, what does it mean to practice architecture today, what's the point of it, uh, what, what can we do realistically, uh, what makes sense and also maybe what we should uh, look forward to. And this was an incredibly kind of productive discussion that I incredibly kind of appreciate. Uh, this was a really amazing set of fellows uh, that I, I was so privileged to work together with. Uh, so I think that uh, what you will see tonight, uh, namely the kind of domestic simulations, uh, financial uh, formations, as well as managerial hallucinations, is a result of our kind of ongoing discussion uh, uh, throughout the last months. Um, right, however, let's get specific. So I. Um, my part is practice. Uh, I was in practice before coming to Tolman College, uh, but it's also a topic that has been kind of like uh, uh, preoccupying me for a long time, uh, especially in the context of kind of political and economic ideologies and different regimes. I think uh, as much as architects are interested in all kinds of things, uh, we should also be interested in our own practice and the way that we uh, kind of organize and, and, and plan our practice, because uh, obviously there are more and more kind of I see pressures for, for architects to kind of perform and to kind of shape their practice and according to different uh, demands. Um, so yeah, so I started my fellowship with, with a broader hypothesis that uh, there are kind of broader shifts in economy that have significantly altered the face of architectural practice today. And that in a way management of operations uh, in the practice have taken increasingly kind of important role in architectural thinking uh, instead of, let's say, some kind of other profound um, engagement with culture, politics, uh, uh, even design, uh, in a way. So I spent my fellowship in a way to investigate this uh, and to see how much of my hypothesis can be verified uh, or not. Um, I suspect that every major uh, crisis uh, uh, in the world uh, it changes the face of architecture. Uh, so did the 2008 crisis. And probably the ones that we are going through right now will change uh, architecture too, in some way. 
Um, and, I, and, and on a general note, I hope that we can collectively start to kind of have discussions about what it is going to be already now and, and to see where this is going. Because I think it's important not to lose sight of uh, the future, which even though it feels like it's cancelled, it will uh, come in one way or another. So the image that you see uh, comes from uh, one of the world, kind of one of the well-known architectural practices operating today. Um, and in my view, the kind of list of uh, adjectives in this kind of uh, very concise manifesto uh, reflects a kind of broader temperament uh, in architecture that is in a way needed to succeed in the kind of today's marketplace to do any substantial kind of uh, work. Um, so in a way you have to attempt to please everyone, tick all the boxes, say yes to everything and maintain some kind of a disguise of a like unconditionally positive uh, uh, agent of change. Uh, and in a way, uh, I, I, I think that, that that's something that is kind of, uh, kind of maybe seems very obvious nowadays, but I still find it kind of uh, strange because at least the way that I was educated is that architecture was always supposed to kind of uh, in, engage in some kind of positive way without uh, kind of, uh, yeah, that kind of a superficial uh, statement. So, um, so in a way uh, to kind of tick all the boxes uh, in a way nowadays to kind of be kind of, uh, to be competitive in the architectural marketplace. I think uh, it seems to me that in, in architecture, one's, one needs uh, much more than just the design ability, but rather, rather some kind of managerial, uh, man managerial uh, capacity. Um, so for instance, management of projects, uh, management of people, management of uh, business and management of, uh, of finances. Um, so uh, by some accounts, the kind of roots of architectural management as a kind of discipline can be traced back to the 1960s when the kind of first books uh, devoted to the management were kind of uh, published. Um, however, on, on a broad scale, the architecture, engineering and construction kind of uh, industries probably started to kind of ad really adopt this kind of idea that they need to manage uh, 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 themselves more as a business probably came a few decades uh, later in probably probably partially in kind of response to this you know changing procuring procurement methods uh, where kind of engineers and larger companies and all kinds of uh, bureaucrats could uh, kind of take a, uh, like a bigger role um, and I think uh, probably one of the kind of greatest uh, acknowledgements uh, by just looking at what's been written in terms of theory about architectural management and management of architectural practice, is the acknowledgement that, that most of architectural labor and, and is immaterial and it cannot be subjected to some kind of uh, inventory management. So therefore running a practice becomes a kind of really careful balancing act uh, uh, between kind of immediate uh, demand and supply of architectural services. Uh, and nowadays there is kind of a really wide array of both material and immaterial technologies uh, to uh, support this uh, process. Um, so, and, and this kind of insights, if you will, um, is not unlike what we can find also in the kind of lineages of business management theory, right? Uh, and, and I really try to kind of spend some time to also look at, you know, where, where are all these like ideas that like suddenly we have to kind of uh, um, um, try to organize our practice according to some business principles. Uh, I mean, where, where is all that coming from in a way? Uh, and of course, there are big architectural corp corporations over the 20th century that we know. Uh, but then we see that more and more these ideas are kind of like gradually being absorbed into a broader set of uh, uh, practices that are not just these large corporations. So, and, and, and in fact, so I spent a lot of time lo looking at just trying to understand for myself um, the kind of history of uh, business management and well, where, do you, what, where did all these ideas about how to organize your operations uh, uh, really come from. And then there's a really interesting broad array of uh, thinkers from I don't know, Peter Drucker to John Roberts, uh, or from Frederick uh, Mislow Taylor to Mary Parker Follett, and, and so on, who have all kind of contributed to this kind of gradual emergence of, of management uh, theory, starting from the late 19th century uh, to the present day. Um, and in context of, of that, I think it's uh, what is important to mention uh, tonight is uh, and also in, in the context of architectural practice and management of architectural practice. 
Uh, I think the work by Lillian and Franka Gilbreths is particularly kind of interesting. Uh, so Lillian was a psychologist and Frank was a bricklayer. Uh, and uh, together as a couple, they kind of turned to be incredibly influential in the kind of early management uh, theory. What's interesting is that they really have this like spatial means of uh, analyzing uh, productivity of labor. Uh, they conducted this kind of well-known fatigue studies and in their theory, they tried to kind of uh, class kind of categorize um, the, the kind of uh, fatigue that is useful and the kind of fatigue that is not useful. Um, and then and they built all kinds of machines and, and, te and technologies to kind of measure the fatigue and to measure the efficiency of motion. Uh, and efficiency of motion, or let's say the elimination of waste motion, is at the, at the basis of kind of any kind of capitalist uh, kind of optimization of, of a company from from early 20th century up to, to today. Uh, if you look at what, let's say, kind of Toyota production systems that are still at play to today, it's still about like constant improvement and reduction of a kind of waste motion, reduction of uh, a kind of uh, unnecessary excess. Uh, a small note here, uh, what we can see now with the kind of crisis of supply chains during the kind of global pandemic is that many of those ideas of optimization actually have proven to be kind of uh, not that viable in, in a time of crisis, uh, uh, but again, we'll talk about it later. Um, um, yeah, so I think that uh, going back to uh, Gilgrets, I think what's interesting is that it's not only the way that they measured eff effectivity of work, but, but also in a way uh, I found fascinating to look at their work and, and their kind of prototypes of all kinds of technologies to boost worker productivity. Uh, and they, they, they did a lot and uh, they have all kinds of like like physical product based uh, kind of inventions uh, kind of uh, intended to kind of make workers uh, more effective and also kind of more satisfied with their lives. Um, so on the left side, you see kind of motion studied uh, desk or desk that, that, that was designed ostensibly for a white color worker. Um, and that was basically like uh, kind of organized in a way that kind of there will be as, as little as possible waste motion when using that table uh, when, when, when working there. Uh, on the right, even better, uh, what, what I found fascinating is the kind of so-called one motion pencil rack. Uh, and, and also the pencil rack was intended to kind of like reduce any waste motion. So you would need to make only one motion to pick up the pencil from the uh, uh, desk. Um, and in a way, I mean, if you really kind of extrapolate and, 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 and go a few decades down this kind of uh, uh, lineage, um, we see that, I mean, one of the kind of insights of, of, of or, or kind of uh, premises and under which I developed my project was that, in a way, uh, the kind of management of architectural uh, practice, and you can apply it to many service-driven enterprises in a way, um, they are rooted in this kind of like both immaterial as well as material uh, technologies of management. So, in, in a way, you know, the kind of optimization of, of work and, and, and workers and processes kind of is both is both something that you do in terms of like uh, kind of immaterial abstract scheming of uh, how to run things but also in a way have, uh, think, thinking of what kind of uh, 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 inventory you need to kind of uh, make those operations uh, uh, possible um, so and I think that uh, when we think about the kind of convergence of you know the kind of history of business management theory and the ideas how to keep op optimizing business perpetually so there will be less and less waste and more and more uh, profit, less and less expense, uh, more and more re revenue. Um, you know, and, and the architectural world, I think that the, there are quite a few interesting uh, uh, contact points. Um, and in a way we can see that, I mean, this was one of the interesting reports that I found from McKinsey and Company. Uh, McKinsey and Company, for those who might not know it, uh, is one of the kind of world's leading uh, kind of or largest or most elite uh, business consultancy who basically kind of uh, come into large companies and they try to kind of fix and optimize uh, their businesses and solve, solve problems uh, existent or non-existent. Um, also, I need to note here that uh, in some of today's architectural practices that, that we might know about, especially the large ones, there, there are people who, in, in a way, Kind of really have kind of worked in, in this kind of business consulting uh, uh, in, in industries, and again, it's not a new thing. We can look at SOM or whatever; there are always business people involved. But I think it's interesting to see as a contact point when there's like business consulting and this idea of kind of optimization of 
of, of, of work, optimization of your processes, whether in, in a factory or in an architectural company or some, something else. Um, uh, and, and yeah, in a way, kind of like uh, uh, the kind of world of uh, design and the world of, kind of so called cultural practice. Um, so basically, this is a recent report when they try to kind of uh, take on the kind of, the kind of building industry and to kind of solve their problems or again to eliminate the waste, right? To, 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 to make sure that uh, we are building more efficiently, we save more money and, and, and things just go more uh, kind of more, more smoothly, right? So they're smoothing things out, whether it's, uh, and if you look at their work, if you look at what McKinsey does, they are in every industry from government uh, to oil and gas, uh, to architecture and construction. Um, so what they are proposing is to kind of reshape regulation, to rethink the contracts in this case, uh, and also very interestingly to rethink design. Uh, and that's, an, and for another time we should, we could discuss well, what could, what, what do they mean by that? And also to infuse architecture with uh, technology and innovation. So in a way there's, there's this kind of all these ideas how to kind of make what we do or in a way, what architecture does, kind of more efficient, more smooth, more compliant uh, uh, um, to, to the market. And in a way, and there's a lot of pressure, and this is just one example, but if you really look at the kind of oral, overall landscape, uh, there's a lot of pressure for architecture to kind of perform in accordance to some kind of like financial metrics more and more. Um, you, you can see that, especially early like in 70s and 80s, when there was this like wave of financialization, uh, happening there was this kind of a push to kind of expand the field of expertise for large practices at that time to kind of really focus on speculative developments uh things that maybe won't be ever be built but still bring in profit uh, both uh, domestically and uh, abroad um so and i think uh, maybe introduction of bim in architecture is one of the kind of late uh, technological uh, consequences of this managerial uh, turn um, but of course, it's also about kind of uh, more general kind of shift of infusion of technology uh, and kind of maybe kind of entrepreneurial thinking in, 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 in practice. So in this context, um, my exhibition or my part of the exhibition uh, deals with exploring the kind of managerial turn in architecture during the kind of onset of the current immaterial uh, um, economy and to kind of try to uh, build and draw or represent artifacts of, let's say, some kind of post avant-garde, post, post 2008, maybe, uh, architecture practice. Um, and, and in a way, there are like uh, three things that I, I made. Uh, in a way, when I started this work, there was an idea that I could try to kind of uh, speculate about some alternative models and things, how, how things could work differently. Um, I think that it's a complex matter in a way, and, and what I discovered is that probably kind of like a really kind of a brutal intensification of the existing situation, maybe it's probably the first uh, step of a greater understanding them uh, 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 better, and, and I really kind of uh, cho cho chose to stick to that in, in the project. Um, so the, the the first part of the uh, uh, or the first of the three items is the kind of series of uh, drawings. Uh, uh, basically, uh, they are all flowchart drawings uh, trying to kind of indicate or map uh, the various transformations that have taken place in relation to architectural practice over the last uh, decades. So. For instance, it's the transformation from architectural corporation to AEC firm, uh, transformation from architecture to the architecture of the market, um, transformation from uh, commodity to spectacle, transformation from architectural modernity to uh, post-architectural uh, modernity, uh, and, and so on. So in a way, uh, each of those uh, drawings uh, is, is in a way based on a text uh, so uh, a text that has been important uh, in, in the project. And, and then six of those drawings are in a way kind of like uh, semi-subjective representations of, of those texts, but I also am trying to kind of convey some other kind of uh, organizational uh, meaning of those uh, ideas. Um, all right. Um, so uh, the second part of my project uh, is uh, a, pr a prototype for a flexible uh, working desk. So if we, if you re recall the kind of like experiments on prototypes and efficient furniture, um, this is basically a kind of a prototype of a flexible working desk. It is designed to be kind of low cost and high speed 
solution uh, to the question of uh, kind of uh, uh, flexible uh, workspace. Um, so the base of this desk is basically a prefabricated uh, kind of aluminium system uh, that can be basically kind of adjusted to different configurations. Uh, and the top part is kind of laminated uh, a single kind of, or sorry, it's double a plywood uh, plate. And it's all kind of held together by these uh, shock absorbers that are supposed to kind of uh, uh, mitigate any kind of unexpected turbulences in uh, uh, the process. Um, so the table uh, has no permanent fixtures uh, and it can be assembled and, and disassembled in, in about 30 minutes uh, from, uh, or maybe up to 45 minutes. Um, so in 30 minutes, you can basically turn it into like a pile of aluminum uh, rubber and a sheet of plywood. Um, so um, basically, this is useful for the kind of uh, potential changes in the amount of uh, workers in an architectural office. Uh, so in, in a way, it, it could be like um, basically disassembled and, and, and stored uh, or maybe deployed very quickly. Um, this table can also be moved very easily uh, around the workspace. Uh, this is quite helpful uh, to kind of achieve maximum kind of uh, flexibility for uh, teamwork, uh, um, collaboration, and, and all kinds of like uh, global market uh, turbulences that might uh, require an, an immediate rearrangement of the kind of productive capacity of an architecture office. So as you see in a video, it, it's, it, it takes like, a, like two fingers to move the whole uh, table. So, so it's, it's very smooth uh, in its operation. Um, and finally, um, there's a rig for a video game. So the biggest part of my fellowship was a, a video game, which effectively was a simulation. Uh, and, and this is kind of a custom made rig to kind of uh, contain all the equipment and the game controllers uh, all in the kind of uh, uh, same piece is built out of the same materials that the kind of that, that the overall table um, and, and all the other pieces of the exhibition. Um, and, and this is how it looks like when you are playing the video games. So, so the kind of rig is or, uh, oriented towards a large uh, kind of projection screen. So it kind of like almost like immersive kind of reality situation. Um, so, so the video game is basically a kind of a stroll through a hypothetical lean architectural office. Uh, I started working on this game uh, pre-COVID uh, isolation era. But this kind of idea of immersive reality already back then seemed to be very relevant, uh, especially when thinking how to represent a somewhat elusive topic of uh, management of architectural practice, um, something that is it's in a way kind of intangible. Um, so I thought to, to kind of really use the visual language of a kind of digital walkthrough uh, experience. It's something that is commonly used uh, by architects uh, to kind of represent uh, their, their future projects uh, that may or may not materialize. Um, in this case, it's a, re it's a real time 3D game environment that you can experience uh, either in VR or on like 2D screen uh, to basically just uh, st stroll through and just to kind of experience the kind of like uh, hyper managerial office. So as you see, some people are uh, re arresting. The, the work never ceases. It's a 24 hour uh, operation. In a way, you could say this is the most efficient office space. It's somewhat cozy, friendly, hip, perfectly measured and productive. Uh, but at the same time, it's also messy. Um, there are errors and glitches. Um, so as the global market fluctuates, uh, so does this workspace. Um, some of the office furniture is sleek, elegant, and perfectly functional. Um, but occasionally, there are other pieces that make no sense. Uh, it almost seems as if in the kind of effort of making things perfectly functional and smooth, uh, some weird and unusable kind of permutations uh, arose. Um, so it's almost as if like this function was the kind of ultimate state of functionality uh, for this kind of organization. Um, this environment is built as a non-game, uh, which means that there are no structured goals, objectives, and challenges. Uh, so you, as a player, uh, you kind of wander through the office space, just observing its op operations, observing its uh, performance, and just imagining, like uh, you know, uh, what, what could be the kind of productive output of this place? Uh, maybe none. Um, so. This is my last slide, uh, and this is probably one of my favorite kind of images from, from the kind of exhibition uh, process. Uh, it shows the space one day before uh, uh, being finished. Um, basically, um, 
it's uh, there are two things I want to say with this image in a way. Uh, that's uh, I see that very much my fellowship project is still in progress, and tonight it was only like a, we managed to glance you know, over it. Um, I think one of the lingering questions might be what comes uh, next, or what are the alternatives, or, or, or what, what else could be done with architecture. Um, it's not something that I have prepared for tonight, but uh, I'm currently teaching a studio which is dealing with the kind of issue of how to decommission architecture, how to unbuild architecture. And in a way, what we, and there's really amazing work done by my students. So I feel that, uh, and I ho hope that I could share this with you at some other time, but basically, uh, because it's still in progress, uh, but basically I think the idea of uh, unbuilding or slowing things down or, or, or kind of like almost doing, the, trying to reverse what we do in architecture by taking things apart and, and, re and almost like reducing the kind of global amount of uh, square feet uh, might be one way to really think of like fundamental alternatives uh, to this kind of like ever expanding managerial uh, uh, practice. Um, so I, th I think that, uh, that 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 that's very important to note. And and, and second of all, I, th I think that in in general it, it's it's important that uh, I think in today's age that in general we explore more and more kind of uh, possibilities of immaterial. 3D environments in ways of constructing kind of nonlinear narratives, and I think that in, in general, the kind of virtual and kind of non-game environments is something that I think us as architects and as also non-architects who probably are watching uh, is something that we should uh, uh, kind of embrace. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, so I will pass on the stage to uh, Jacob. Okay, great. Um, just sharing my things now. Um, okay. So, um, thanks, Matis. Uh, so, um, first, as um, Matis did as well, I just want to give a quick bunch of thanks. Um, still so bizarre that this is happening in this way, but I'm glad nonetheless that whoever is here is here. It means a lot to all of us that you guys are taking the time um, during these crazy times. Um, so again, to the fellowship committee and Sharon for um, providing me with the opportunity to teach and collaborate with students and the um, fabulous community of faculty and staff. Um, uh, to make things for this exhibition. Um, to Kelly Moore and the facilities team and everyone at the Annex for letting us squat in their space. To Laura Brown for answering literally any question. Well, I mean, I should think on behalf of all of us, probably all, all of us for thanking Laura Brown for everything that we've ever asked for. Um, to my students who have helped um, expand my understanding of co-working, co-living and furniture design. Um, a huge, huge, huge thanks to assistants and friends, Christian Austin, Eli Back, Adrian DiCorado, Ziwan Lee, Laura Lisbona, Chris Humphrey, Sangwon Ji, and Dan Rei Zhang for their intellect, talent, and commitment to seeing this project through. To my fellow fellows, Matis and Eduardo, whose inspiring work has greatly shaped my own. And as always, to Ingrid Lau for her relentless skepticism and unconditional support. So I hope you all like the stuff. Um, so first a bit of background to contextualize the work with the caveat that much of this thinking um, was uh, done pre-COVID-19. So the future of co-working and co-living um, as well as any future job prospects that I might have is uh, much less certain than it was just a few months ago. But assuming that eventually things will continue more or less in the way they were, major US cities will continue to see increases in co-working and co-living spaces resulting from rising real estate values, urban migration, and digital nomadism. An incoming generation of itinerant professionals find these companies low risk rental and subscription models, various amenities, and tight knit communities desirable as they provide conditions otherwise attainable unattainable rather as individual renters. So this fellowship capitalizes on um, 
financial strategies of major co-working and co-living companies that lease office space, perform interior fit outs with, a, with patented equipment, furniture, technology, and amenities, and sublease that space for profit. These companies produce total environments by way of what they call the quote, space as service model. Environments equipped not only with desks, conference rooms, and coffee bars, but also with an invisible set of protocols which facilitate the politics, organizational structures, and management of people in space. It's also worth mentioning um, the burgeoning furniture rental industry is a key influence um, in my own work. One startup of particular interest, Geometry, a subsidiary um, to its parent co-working company, Notel, supplies Notel's users with modular furniture equipment um, subscriptions. They need to do their job. So for instance, you can rent a desk or a conference room for a monthly fee. So this kind of one-stop shop, which incorporates the design of furniture and co-working into one. So this model very much serves as a springboard for the way I've conceived of the work I've done. Um, over the course of the fellowship. Um, and I think it's also worth mentioning uh, why architects, I think, should care about furniture, um, or why I care about furniture anyway. So oftentimes architects treat smaller, smaller than building scale, i.e. jewelry, tea sets, furniture, pavilions, as an ideological or technological testing ground for an eventually building scale proposal. So think Felix Candela concrete pavilions or Peter Eisenman's rings or Greg Lynn's tea towers or his ravioli chair, Werner Patton's Visiona projects, etc. The work I'm doing sidesteps this, um, opting instead to, to adopt a practice more closely related to that of a furniture or industrial designer monetizing and reproducing the pavilion scaled equipment within the realm of co-working and co-living. The argument for serialized furniture is also one about agency. At a time when profit-driven real estate schemes increasingly tightened regulations, BIM standards, and the mass production of building components have rendered the architect increasingly powerless in the production of the built environment, this research and design proposes there's an opportunity to learn from these companies' modes of operation, which nimbly adapt to socioeconomic conditions and produce architecture at scale. A close friend and colleague told me earlier last year that it's punk to get paid. And while initially skeptical, I've since leaned into the statement. So if I become a neoliberal hack, uh, it's your fault, Lida. Um, so, the work on display is a proposal for a readily deployable series of discrete architectural objects, which can be assembled, disassembled, and transported with ease, unbound by typical building regulations and costing a fraction of ground up building. As previously stated, the project operates somewhere between the space of architecture, industrial design, and furniture design. A soft architecture produced not in units of one, but many an itinerant serialized catalog of equipment. So there's a model of practice being proposed in my fellowship work, but there's also designed objects, um, I made things. That is to say, people can adopt the method that I'm talking about, the, the method of practice, but the outcome could look very different as it does with something like geometry. Um, much of the actual content of my design work is a critique on traditional domestic architecture. So think single family homes, apartment complexes, things we're most familiar with. There's socially isolating features, strict programmatic delineations and wasteful redundancies in utilities, furniture and equipment. So in lieu of those, the fellowship work proposes a world where the only private property owned is a nine by six by 12 living capsule and all other pieces of equipment are shared across the entire community. Um, the capsule, I'm gonna talk about the pieces. So the capsule conceived of as a perforated thick gauge power, powder coated steel structure has a thick base allowing for storage of bedding and other personal items. Um, that thick base also doubles as a seat or a porch depending on the configuration of the units. The unit contains foldable storage racks, accordion doors, sound and light proof curtains, and built-in ambient uh, ceiling lighting. 
Um, these easily movable sleeping units accommodate a variety of configurations, ranging from informal clustered arrangements to more structured rigid grids, accommodating a variety of domestic settings um, and or preferences. And in any successful cooperative, certain responsibilities are divided amongst members of the community. And each piece of equipment designed um, always has this in mind. So for example, with this table, the tabletop thickness allows for the storage of shared plates, bowls, glasses, and silverware to be washed and restocked by a member of the community. Each piece of equipment anticipates a quote, space as service model, one which is meant to work in tandem with the protocols inherent in any successfully governed collective. And as a kind of formal and material cousin of the table, the kitchen and its equipment, oven, dishwasher, et cetera, wasn't so much reimagined um, as it was condensed into a thick line and formed into a freestanding object. The kitchen is double-sided or mirrored with an overhead illumination um, system whose vertical structural elements allow for the hanging of shared cookware on a steel mesh grid, as you can see. Um, the next couple of pieces deal with storage, um, display, and spatial division. Um, so something my students um, and I over the course of this past or this last semester have learned and in hindsight of um, uh, the kind of open floor plan office system, um, in hindsight it's kind of obvious, is that people like uh, barriers for privacy and sound blocking and all kinds of things. They like their private space. So the promise of the completely open office is uh, a false one, I think. And so something important in this design project was to always have that in mind and be thinking about um, ways in which space could be divided, not by you know more conventional party wall systems, but by objects, still movable objects. So the above um, wooden piece that you're seeing above the black model, um, for instance, is a thick porous storage wall with space for public display as well as hidden storage contained within pole drawers. In addition to storing and displaying things, it acts as a partition wall, which helps to subdivide the space with regards to both privacy and program. And it's worth noting that um, all of the pieces that I'm showing um, are basically one thing that, do, uh, that does many things. So this storage wall, again, has the capacity to provide a threshold to divide one space for, from another, to store things, um, and to display objects. Um, so, so maybe it's a good time now to take a step back to um, look at another object that was designed over the course of the semester um, and built. Um, the display cabinet system that you're seeing, the wood boxes with the green um, fabric. Um, in the exhibition that you kind of are seeing, um, it's holding all of the models of the other pieces. The idea is that it's able to kind of um, put in a co-working or co-living situation, it's able to be a storage space for, you know, books or whatever people want to put inside. It can be a display cabinet for art or whatever. Um, as modules, the pieces are able to connect to one another via green ripstop fabric and zipper connection. This is the kind of situation, by the way, that um, I was really happy with McLean saying that not everything had to make sense. Um, so going to the fabric store and just buying ripstop fabric and zippers was very liberating. And knowing that I had institutional support to do that was wonderful. So, uh, so there it is. There's wooden boxes connected with green ripstop fabric and zippers. Um, the, uh, Here's another orientation of that same um, cabinet system, a U-shaped arrangement in a different setting, um, forming a more distinct interior and exterior condition. So um, if here it's about a kind of zigzag where either side is you know, easily accessible, this one is about a kind of understanding of a clear moment of intimacy. 
Um, and just a quick shot of the the back, so you can really see that it privileges um, it privileges one side. Um, so the piece has rotating panels, which allow for three different orientations um, to store and or display things, as well as deep cabinets um, that you can see at the bottom, which provide structural support and hidden storage space. Um, so next, um, if any co-living or co-working space, you need a toilet. So this is that. Um, it plugs into existing building infrastructure. And again, it's important to reiterate the point that all of this is meant to be understood as being inserted into existing buildings rather than ground up construction for all the reasons I listed before. Um, the, the cylindrical toilet shower unit um, contains a sliding door leading to a shower head above with adjacent toilet and sink. Storage compartments for shared robes, uh, towels, and slippers occupy the thickness of the walls. Um, robes, towels, and other pieces of clothing can be washed using the laundry system, which is diagrammatically similar to the kitchen in that it has a th it's a thick line um, with mirrored storage, folding space, and uh, washer dryers on either side. And the piece is meant to serve 10 to 12 units. Um, so as, again, to cut down on that kind of excessive uh, redundancy of utilities um, and free up space for life and work. Um, so this image is an instance where all pieces of equipment are aggregated into a single space. The units are placed in various orientations, as I was talking about earlier. So some are more kind of informal. The green zone, for instance, has a kind of like, um, presumably people who knew each other would live there, but there's also a kind of um, gridded arrangement for others. Um, and those are broken up um, uh, by storage and display walls and then filled with kitchens, dining areas, and workspaces. And the toilet and um, toilet slash shower units serve as eight units each, um, which are the red, um, top bottom left and top right. Um, so again, it's a sort of like something important with this project also is um, competing with, because all of these are conceived of as being in dense, expensive cities, something important is to compete with the density of, you know, like a, a competitive uh, co-working environment or company. So maintaining a kind of square footage per person is important uh, in this project for me. Um, so there's Eduardo playing The Sims. And he has very good posture, so he kind of looks like a Sim, which is great. Um, so uh, the incorporation of, so something I did, um, this was at uh, Montes' fault because he started making video games, so. Um, one of the most popular video games of all time, just by number of copies purchased, probably most of you have either know it or have seen it or have played it. Um, for 20 years, The Sims have, has been a vehicle for gamers to realize their kind of ultimate domesticity. They can have power over the smallest details. And while the game has grown more politically progressive since its release in 2000, um, its architectural offer offerings are still um, very orthodox. Um, so, oops, so you'll be able to see it now. Um, so through playing and modding The Sims, I found the ways in which The Sims programmers understood object affordances to be largely in line with something like the Architects Neufert catalog. Um, the same types of presumptions privileging able-bodied heteronormative people of a certain literal stature. Um, and that it's quite difficult within the confines of amateur modding, um, like what I'm doing, um, to alter this. So, or to kind of alter these presuppositions about the way that furniture ought to be used. Um, so in a word, it was not, it was kind of difficult to do this. Um, this is like a comedic relief for people who are feeling sad in their homes right now. Um, but, uh, so 
um, within within my system of equipment, there are often confused sim strange approximations of conventional furniture uses and all kinds of glitches where the sims are trying in vain to use the equipment that might be um, foreign to them. Um, and I think using video games, um, you know, like Matis kind of spoke to this a little bit, but it's a useful kind of democratic tool um, or mode of representation for architects and that most people play them um, and there are built-in simulated personalities and customizable characters which re viewer users can empathize with and I think it really um, I mean even watching it on video is very different than because obviously the hope is that visitors of the gallery would be able to play it because I think it really is a unique way of experiencing kind of architectural work, um, whatever it is. Um, but, so, do, 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 let's see. Okay, so, um, and the last image I want to leave you with is simulated people having a party, eating and dancing around the table in a not socially distanced manner, which I wish we could have had together. But I appreciate very much you all, or whoever is here, um, joining our digital exhibition. And um, I hope you've brought your own um, drinks or whatever you like. So thanks so much. And I'll pass it on to, to Eduardo. Cool. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Jacob, for how was your time. Yeah, I do have a good posture. <laughs> um, anyways, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, this is um, this is Eduardo Maviero. I'm the Fishman Fellow here at Tamman College. Um, and I also need to start with a few thanks. Uh, many of the people that I want to thank have already been thanked. So I'll keep it short and just mention an amazing team of people without whom all of this would not have been possible. Uh, I can see Anderson, Lindsay Barranco, Jamie Lee, and Victor Martikian. But also it's, uh, it's not only special to be the first uh, Fishman Fellow, but to share this experience and opportunity with, um, with Robert himself has been really amazing. So I'd like to personally thank Robert Fishman for his support and generosity. Uh, I guess I'm really, really, truly grateful. Um, Okay, so let's uh, let's jump into it. On October 10th of 2019, the annual report on global commercial real estate investment activity published by the firm Cushman & Wakefield displayed one major anomaly. Foreign real estate investment in the city of Madrid had increased 202% in just one year, the highest rise ever registered in this classification as Madrid leapt from a 19th place in 2018 to now fourth, just behind global financial capitals like New York, London, and Paris. And when investors and public administrators reason that such exponential growth is derived from Madrid's attractive cultural offerings and financial stability, a more complex reality underlies these narratives. In a city where the belief in private property is thought to be an inalienable right, and property laws hold personal gain over public interest, Madrid's hyperaccumulation should not be a shock to anyone. To fully understand the consequences that private property has had in the city of Madrid, we must take into account various circumstances that are most of the times overlooked. Its historical character, constantly in evolution, its fictional nature, and more importantly, its ideological background. By understanding that the claim of property is a subjective construct rather than a given definition, one can start to comprehend the extent of its influence and start to challenge it. And while the argument has been made that property per se goes as far back as several millennia in the establishment of agrarian societies during the Bronze Age, it is not until the first century in ancient Rome that it acquired legal definition. In the year 161, uh, Roman jurist Gaius drew some light over the discussion regarding property rights over public and private goods in his treatise Institutes. Gaius made two main distinctions, things that were subject to private ownership and able to be sold, the resting commercium, and those that pertain to the public realm and thus insusceptible of being traded, the rest extra commercium. And while this distinction may seem uh, trivial, it does define a fundamental basis of private property, 
which is its ability to grant economic value to a good by virtue of its limited nature. For Gallus, the trade of private goods was only focused on material corporeal entities, physical things, the res corporale. Only what could be seen, weighed, and touched was adequate for exchange and therefore speculation. Incorporeal entities such as contracts, use of rights, or obligations were hence subject of non-economic value. And this is a distinction that has been carried to this very first day, to, to, to today. However, with the rise of uh, neoliberalism in the 1980s and the subsequent deregulation and privatization of capital markets, we have witnessed a soaring competition for goods, many now immaterial, that of course Gadius was unable to consider, right? In the last few decades, financial capitalism has generated new unprecedented immaterial assets that have challenged the ability of property laws to establish clear boundaries. Lands, buildings, and objects now have been replaced by bonds, derivatives, and stocks, sets of goods that are not only unperceivable, but also limitless, an infinite financial structure that is unable to accommodate the never-ending hyperaccumulation that neoliberal economies are generating. However, investment assets of financial capitalism require a certain degree of liquidity, this is, of available capital, in order to operate at a certain sort of scale of buying, selling, and investing. So real estate as an, an immovable good is historically speaking the quintessential illiquid asset. As Matthew Soles points out, lands, buildings, and units are expensive, they're large, they require maintenance, they tend to be highly idiosyncratic in time and space, and they're situated within complex and nuanced sociopolitical contexts, which basically makes them very time consuming to buy and sell. The financialization of the built environment overcame this limitation through the manufacturing of financial instruments that provided a high degree of liquidity and speed global economies were creating. Financial instruments such as real estate investment trusts or subprime mortgages, or even here to the right, the Abacus 2007 AC1 model that Goldman Sachs came out with. Um, were sort of models that uh, operated as liquid intermediaries for property ownership. And while these instruments in increase the amount of architecture, of production of architecture through the insatiable aim of urbanization, there was also a clear effort in increasing, sort of in defining the design of the built environment through the, through the production of a series of physical financial formations, where a soul defines the urbanization of capital. So when looking at our cities and the repercussions that finance capitalism's reliance on property has had on our built environment, the mere notion of the urban must be brought into question. While many will define the urban condition as an interconnected movement of goods, people, and ideas, its foundational core is based in the application of private property as a tool for control. To understand the urban as the abstraction of processes of efficiency and control, is to acknowledge its capability for economic profit as the sole reason for its existence, and pretty much the whole entire like, premise of this research. Um, Ross Exo Adams also adds that the urban is an invention, a technology that operates the spatial union of private property and circulation, and that therefore it is legible and reproducible, a category radically opposed to the idea of a city or of the police. So the notion of urbanization, this is the self-expansion of the urban, a term attributed to Spanish engineer Ildefonso Cerda, attempts to enclose a particular expression of power through spatial orders in which, as Adams states, the idea of circulation is crucial for giving order to the fiscal world, as well as making legible the forms of power that ruled over it. But while for Cerda, circulation implied the provision of services, goods, and people through a formless network of roads, rails, and pipes, Today, with the financialization of the urban environment, circulation acquires a slightly different meaning as now it's fictional capital in the form of financial instruments what is being moved around. The urban has now become the arena of neoliberalism's capitalist expansion. So unlike the city or the polis, the term urban or urbs implies an a priori conception of the city. This is if the polis was a result of adjoining individuals into a community that recognize themselves as such, the herbs is constituted from the top down, right? It's generic status foreign to the rules of place and time. And while the polis was specific, spontaneous, unbounded, the herbs is generic, deliberate, and limitless. The herbs and its subsequent uh, historical mutations, the suburbs, the exurbs, the transurbs, the neo-herbs, and so on, came to designate a universal and generic condition of cohabitation, 
in service of finance capitalism. So today, as real estate markets value uh, continue to rise towards another catastrophic collapse, it is crucial to push for a city model where the exchange value of goods is rendered insignificant or even irrelevant. To push for an understanding of the city as far away from the term herbs as possible, that which is not urban, or what I call the non-herbs, thus becomes not only an oppositional counterforce, but a social responsibility for those committed in defending the common over private interests. Against the infinite totalitarian character of the herbs, the non-herbs present itself as an isolated and delimited. It is tangible, material, and bounded. A constellation of individual and close objects, independent but highly interconnected. The non-herbs is not an alternative, but a resistance. The non-herbs is a city within the city. So this non-herbs is constructed of a series of, uh, sort of an aggregation of a series of financial formations, uh, four of which I will be explaining um, today. The exhibition apartment, the advertising ad, the unproductive factory and the stock interchange. These four provocations depart from the conventions of contemporary financial instruments and offer an alternative post-property scenario in which the circulation of capital is rendered irrelevant. Credit swaps, synthetic collateralized debt obligations and alternative derivatives are put into use through what could be considered hyperbolic realities that evidence the deficiencies of a system in service of personal profit and exploitation. These complex abstract systems are represented through a series of diagrams that exemplify the possibility of translating its immaterial presence into a quantifiable meaning. Within an urban space increasingly governed by financial capital and its algorithms, the challenge presented was to translate the abstract into the materialized spaces of our daily lives. This process derived into a series of physical financial formations that increase the available liquidity of the markets upon achieving greater ease and speed of its transactions. Or put in other words, build forms that are created to be generators of capital. So let's go through, um, through these four. Um, the exhibition apartment, uh, the first one, it's a classic spatial product of real estate, right? We all know it. It allows buyers to imagine themselves in the physical space, sort of a physical one-to-one uh, -one model while permitting developers initial minimal investments. So this first uh, financial formation departs from the use of credit swaps to create a shared ownership scheme in which the asset is infinitely swapped to constantly increase its value. The excess of capital is then extracted into a co-op that runs a full structure. And the project uh, sort of formally takes the uh, penthouse of one of Madrid's latest luxury developments, La Gasca 99, as the one and only residential unit of the project a unit to be collectively owned, but never occupied. The advertising ad bases its existence in the reciprocal income of capital through self-promotion. A series of time-based bonds are literally stacked on top of each other to shield the shares from the volatility of the market. And these bonds are sort of materialized into a vertical office structure that is able to generate profit by simply advertising itself. The unproductive factory um, erases the labor struggle in the production of goods, a defining characteristic of its sort of original predecessor, and creates a system that no longer introduces into the market material assets, but immaterial ones. Through three interspirit stages, bonds are created and simultaneously stored, while investors are able to swap them in order, in order to generate profit while waiting for the bonds to get introduced into the market. The materialization of such a system uh, derives into an empty storage space in which the slanted profile of the ceiling questions the representational value that build form inevitably carries. And the last one, uh, the stock interchange, uh, is probably the most ubiquitous representation of the abstract sort of circulatory decree of the market. And this financial uh, formation subverts the conventional trade services of what we know as stock exchange buildings to create a closed system of CDOs or collateral debt obligations that are constantly repackaged and introduced back into the system. The material result is a centralized network that contains the physical infrastructure that holds itself along with a grandiose trade hall that is a symbolic space that no longer needs to be used. So these are sort of the four financial formations that um, sort of exemplify or represent this idea of the non herbs And this was sort of part of like the work that I've been doing for the last few months, but in parallel to that, uh, I sort of 
I worked into uh, a call for proposals, um, a, a sort of call for proposals that uh, invited eight architecture practices uh, from around the world to participate in, in sort of a given brief that challenged the contemporary claim of private property over architecture and that asked sort of the participants to imagine the design possibilities that its illumination could provide. And um, the call included uh, various sort of offices and individuals from Alexis Bertoni from New York City, Casablanca from Mexico, uh, Guillermo and Cristina from Australia, Yuki and Noam from LA, Matilde Casani from Milan, Luis Callejas and Charlotte Hansen from Colombia, Parasite 2.0 from Brussels, and Studio Batten from Norway. And the participants were mailed a short essay and brief that asked them to consider the manual property or public domain as a trigger for alternative modes of cohabitation in a possible urban environment. The proposals consisted in the design of a single room, a room that is, was asked to be totally generic by being absolutely specific. The room was not to be considered as a part of a domestic realm, but rather a, large, a spatial prop of a larger system in which the appropriation of architecture through private property is superseded by inalienable communal protocols. And these proposals were materialized into eight uh, 18 by 18 inch physical models that were actually built here at Taman College. And uh, was also a sort of, they were part of this journal exhibition along with a series of texts that each participant uh, wrote to explain the projects that were sort of varied in form from essays to uh, poems to letters or even uh, manifestos. And it was really actually really incredible to see the sort of varied responses that, uh, that all these sort of projects had to in response to the same brief, right? Um, some participants took the call as an opportunity to explore sort of planetary scales from Luis Callejas and Charlotte Hansen's observatory, a room to contemplate the last place where private property does not exist, space. Or Guillermo Fernández Abascal and Cristina de Lucci's Earth Room, a proposal that seeks new ways of belonging to Earth by exposing its uh, own composition. Other participants uh, looked into the um, appropriation and storage of goods to evidence the limitations of property and some, some of these projects we can even like relate back to uh, Jacob's uh, work from uh, Matilde Casani's high beast locker, a uh, public piece of furniture storing goods for a totally shared economy, or uh, Yuhi and Noam Station, a spiraling store infrastructure that provides all sort of miscellaneous set of objects. And moreover, many ideas also of law and capital were sort of explored in these projects. Here, Alexis Bertoni's uh, work that looked into uh, the displacement of homeless uh, encampments uh, through luxury residential developments in Oakland, California, uh, or even Studio Vatan's uh, The Property uh, Courtroom, a stage ruin that materializes the production of laws and civil codes into actual physical space, and uh, sort of theater that could perfectly be related, related back to sort of the suburban scenography that Parasite 2.0 submitted, or even the playful Mexican toy of Casablanca. So um, and this was sort of like all the sort of proposals that um, the participants uh, submitted. So maybe to conclude this whole uh, spiel, uh, and to end here, I'd say that um, in a time where the free float floating of capital and speculation continues to shape our built environment, the unprofitable dimension of the non-herbs may provide possible solutions to this area. To bring the horizontal egalitarian principles of the public realm of the common into individual pursuits may allow once and for all a system where private financial interest is taken over by common use. Thank you. And now we are going to um, bring into uh, the, the call uh, a few uh, of the faculty here at Taman College for a sort of panel discussion. And that's, we sort of invite you guys, everyone to um, submit questions or comments as we will um, we'll be able to sort of answer them um, here in real time along with uh, Irene, Lida, and Ana Paula. So we have three questions already. So maybe before we start the discussion, we should uh, respond to the questions. We have three questions. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen these. 
Yeah, so, so, so in, in the YouTube chat box. Yeah. So uh, first one uh, is Bakaya Ramirez who asks, what is a managerial hallucination? <laughs> <laughs> That's I amazing. think to extend it a bit, so maybe we can describe what is a managerial hallucination, but also what is a financial formation and so on. So maybe mm -hmm. each of us could uh, try to answer that question. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, Do you want to take managerial yeah. hallucination to start? Yeah, so I think managerial hallucination is, is some kind of a, uh, uh, experience of, you know, in, in kind of involving some kind of apparent perception of uh, necessity uh, that is not really there. Yeah, I mean, I think I have the easy one here, domestic simulation. Um, I was literally using The Sims to simulate domesticity with with the the objects that were designed over the course of the year. So just thinking about using um, kind of AI and the the biases that are built into any AI um, to kind of uh, go head to head with the stuff that we, um, my students and I had um, designed over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, if I, if I were to explain uh, very briefly what these sort of financial formations were these, this idea of the financial formations almost came from the uh, sort of the premise of uh, form follows finance, uh, where, uh, where you actually can actually trace uh, physical built form that responds to specific uh, financial instruments and ownership models. Um, and while the ones that I presented almost uh, had a sort of very provocative sort of um, so sort of condition, we actually in our everyday lives can we live in financial formations. And one of them could be like probably most common of all, the condominium, right? It's sort of uh, vertical stacking of individual ownership to um, sort of repackage and uh, intensify the amount of um, sort of charitable assets in, in one block, for example, right? Um, so they, they are sort of everywhere and it's interesting to sort of look into arch architectural and urban form through, uh, again, through uh, finance and actually be able to, tr to trace these trends. Okay, so we have two, a uh, few more questions. Uh, I don't want to delay the kind of, uh, the kind of discussion, but I think it's good to kind of uh, cover them. So everyone is kind of uh, uh, on the same page about what we did. So the next question is from uh, Jonathan Massey who asks, what is the technique of highlighting? Uh, and I guess it's meant helping the comment on YouTube. Well, I can tell that that happens when you, when you are the streamer of the video, when you're the author of the video, then it just automatically highlights you. But maybe there's some deeper meaning in it and I think maybe we should go contemplate that a bit uh, more. Um, okay, so then there's a question from uh, Mick McConnell uh, asking, are all of the texts on site uh, digital too? Uh, no, they are not, but uh, maybe we can discuss uh, and try to kind of publish them uh, soon. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a question from uh, Angie Roberts uh, Zeltzer uh, asking, given the COVID situation, would you have approached your fellowship differently had you known what situation we would be in today? Maybe a quick, quick idea, what would you do? It kind of corresponds to the the other question by Daham. Could you could you all speak on your experiences translating your projects from physical to digital presentation this month? Um, I don't know if I would. Have, well, actually, I probably would have changed a few things if I had a bit more time to think about the implications of coronavirus on co working and co living. I may have like uh, given that a second thought, but that probably would have had to come like last year before my fellowship presentation. Um, but I think now that we've done it and kind of to Daham's question of translating the projects, I think it's just awkward and I think you have to have fun with it and realize that everybody is in the same bizarre and uncertain situation and maintain a kind of, I know this is like cheesy, but kind of maintain a positivity and just be excited about 133 people giving you support when you have them. So I think it's great. 
Cool. So why don't we uh, invite our three um, invite uh, guests to join the conversation. Um, Ana Paula, Lida, and uh, Irene. They are around. Yeah, we're, yeah, <laughs> they're coming. There they are. Hello. Hi. Oh, there we go. Cool. I kind of have a question right off the bat. Um, I, I think maybe in some ways my question is uh, most directly for um, Jacob, but I think in some way it's for, for everybody. Well, first of all, I want to say huge congrats. Um, you're kind of redefining how this is um, done with like, whatever, like, you know, such grace and skill that it's already, it's already new, a new way of, of, of doing this period, a really exciting and, uh, you know, potentially a keeper. Um, so I want to super congratulate you all on that. Um, so um, you, you all design uh, and kind of propose circumstances of architecture produced like not in, in units, but through either many objects or circumstances that produce a kind of proliferation. So we're one thing times many times is either architecture or um, becomes of an architectural scale. So in this way, we've we've known um, IKEA, UPS, Walmart, like all of these things to like become part of the conversation of architecture recently in a highlighted way. Um, so in this model, scale is not like vertically uh, defined, or it's not defined by like the the size of the um, infrastructure that creates it, say like the, the, the practice even, potentially the size of the practice can be separate from um, its ability to proliferate. Um, so what's the, can we, can we just essentially just like, rather than placing it as a question, can we talk about the multiplier effect um, if in our relationship to the multiplier, multiplier, like is there something as like, pedagogues or practitioners that there's a kind of new skill set involved in um, this format of, of being people that present one instance of a thing to the agency, to the, to the agent that has the ability to multiply it. Um, is, is, there a, is there a new client typology involved? Um, and is that exciting or not? Or is there a new skill set involved? We can all chat, Irene, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this too. Jacob, you wanna? Yeah, I mean, that's like a big, so <laughs> I, no, I think it's, for me, it's like the question of like how, how to think about more nimble practice that also nimble. Um, can be prolific in its output. So like, it's not about like big scale, literally like buildings or cities, it's about small objects and pairing with, that's kind of the, the idea, right? It, I shouldn't do that. It's, that's kind of the idea um, of thinking about co-working. Co-working is a sort of um, alibi just to think about an industry that allows for the designs of one to be, you know, like, like propagated ad nauseum you know so like this is kind of the agency question too for me is like yeah. how did where does the reclamation of agency to be a little over the top for architects come today um, and I think one place or one place I hope is in this realm where it's thinking about yeah like reproducibility and seriality rather than um, like like what like the one-off yeah yeah, I, I have a different kind of answer to that, but also I did a different project in a way, uh, although I agree with what Jacob said. Um, I, and it's kind of really weird to talk about uh, proliferation in today's situation. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, effect, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 but that's like a personal note. Um, 
I think, uh, and I will relate it to like idea of like alternative practices. Um, I think that we are living in a very interesting moment. And in a way, I mean, I'm, I'm young or old enough to remember 2008 because that's when I started studying. And basically my first year of undergrad was like 2008 collapse of everything, collapse of architecture, collapse of architecture, collapse of economy. Um, and, and in a way, after that, what happened is that there was this massive kind of interest in all kinds of alternatives, uh, ideas of like uh, reinventing the system, rethinking also what architects do and so on. And there were a number of publications trying to survey all kinds of other practices that kind of manage that, that could potentially be the kind of other ways of doing things. And you can still see those books in a the library. They are a bit kind of worn out. But uh, if you look at today's situation, like none of those things have picked up and or most of those things have not picked up. And I think it's uh, because of some kind of, there's always, you know, I think that, again, sorry for the reference, but I think it's kind of on point that same as the coronavirus, you need to kind of several things to coincide to make the thing like really proliferate. Uh, in this case, like a multiple kind of, uh, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, kind of genetic mutations that kind of produce this thing. And, and I think the same way kind of works in if, if we think of some really kind of other ways of doing things. Yes, there are many localized examples when thing, people have managed to reinvent the way that they practice. Uh, but these things are not always, uh, sorry for the kind of managerial term, scalable uh, uh, for, for all kinds of externalities. Um, and, and, and I think that I don't, I don't want to be kind of pessimistic about it, but I think that maybe it takes way more time to kind of uh, perfect and, and kind of like ideate uh, the right thing that you want to proliferate and then try to kind of deploy it on bigger scale uh, than just to, I mean, than to just to do it kind of impulsively. Um, if that gives some kind of response to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I were to jump into sort of the scale question, I think which is at least in, in my project extremely, uh, extremely important, right? Because as, as I was mentioning, understanding of sort of architecture in the built environment as a sort of financial asset is, it has always sort of existed at some point, like even from, from the very beginning, I don't know, from Roman times, at uh, sort of speculative understanding of the built environment it's, uh, at some level or, or not, it's been there. Um, but it's actually, as I was saying, it's, it's the moment that it's sort of everything explodes and acquires like a humongous sort of global scale uh, from like the 1980s onwards. Um, when things sort of get out of, uh, get out of sort of question, like question, I don't know, it's, um, so the so maybe the, like the, the the critique maybe would have would have been the problems not understanding of architecture or the built environment as sort of financial asset but the fact that it, it has such a sort of big uh, repercussion right um, which I'll, even in my project again as, as the sort of this idea of the nerves it it can be a replacement right uh, it has to sort of it has to be a sort of a resistance if, like the nerves became the norm then it would become precisely like if it scaled up to again planetary scale then it would be all wrong right um so it always requires a certain sort of almost again ah, damn, i have the word but like i don't want to use it but like yeah sort of like viral sort of quality uh to it right that uh requires of the existing structures of our sort of economic systems to be able to to um to exist yeah Cool. Yeah. Oh, wait. Let's, one second, Irene. We want I to... muted and then oh, I muted myself. Yeah. I can, I can work the mute button. Um, I had a question. Um, I think I'm really, really curious what maybe you guys have, what thoughts you guys have on riffing about uh, neoliberalism. I feel like it really factors in so heavily in all of your work and you know, you've mentioned it um, as a kind of, uh, you know, as a uh, fully accepted system that um, is, is fully ingrained within, you know, at least much of the culture and societies within which your, pro your projects take place and your research is taking place. But for me, I'm really curious about, um, you know, like, what are, 
I'm looking at my notes here, but where is morality within all of that, right? Um, you know, Eduardo, you just referred to kind of the scale change, you know, Lida was talking, like answering Lida's question, but where is morality in all of these things? And, and where is our responsibility in terms of architecture for inserting that? And, and then again, I guess the second part of my question is where's the agency in that, right? What are some myths about the existing power or agency or importance of architecture um, that, you know, Mattis, you really pointed out in 2008, a lot of those uh, existing tropes or existing myths that we have about our own profession really collapsed. So, you know, you guys really attacked this at so many different scales and it's so integrated into culture, but it's so integrated into the kind of manufacturing, uh, the industrial revolution, the neoliberal uh, capitalist uh, ideas, you know, we could even talk about it from Ayn Rand through Thatcher, through Reagan. So I'm just really curious, like, those things are, are really strong still, yet um, how do we objectify them? How do we get outside of them? How do we begin to, to affect them? So I'm just curious for you guys to riff on that. Okay, uh, can I? <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, I, I think this is, a, this is a good question. I, I, I mean, I don't want to go back to kind of my ac academic uh, up upbringing in the Netherlands, but I felt that at the time when I was there in TU, TU Delft in 2012, no, later, 2014, there were, I mean, at least in the kind of, uh, kind of, in many parts of the kind of uh, co many conversations, there was this whole discussion about neoliberalism and, and I kind of very immediately got suspicious about those discussions uh, because that term was, I don't know, I, I felt that, the, and I don't mean to kind of say that uh, I didn't uh, uh, buy the concept, but let's say that there was very kind of like a, a preconditioned attitude towards what it is, and and that that, that that it's something that like is evil, that is destroying us. Uh, and you know, don't get me wrong, we are all victims of uh, those policies in some way or another, and we all or we know someone who has suffered or, or has been kind of like. Uh, you know, subjected to those policies, uh, and 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 the results are mixed, and and, and there are many kind of uh, problems with that. But I, I think that what we try to do with this, what I try to do is to, I think it's too easy to just take like a polemic position, to take a moral position, to say that this is horrible, let's resist it, let's make an alternative, and so on. I mean, I think that whenever someone, especially in academia, says that they are resisting neoliberalism, I get very suspicious, uh, uh, especially in uh, American academia, when we know how the kind of, how this whole thing is financed. Uh, so I think that, I think we should, we should be very careful with like uh, our, our, our statements in, in that regard. And I don't mean to kind of criticize your question, but more in general, um, you know, that I think that we should all accept that we are in this situation where it seems that there is no alternative, that we are all trapped into it, that we all have to face it, and, and that's true. But I think that we should almost like reinvent our terminology, reinvent our thinking, how we think about it, and maybe not even use the term neoliberalism, but really think, uh, just try to generate other kind of ways of uh, understanding of that and other ways of like thinking how we could overcome that, because I think just resisting, I mean, in that sense, probably the most radical act would be to do nothing uh, and, and if we really wanted to resist it. And, but then for how long can we do that? So, or maybe there's something else. But I think that, uh, but at least let's say some kind of uh, self-financed housing cooperatives, I don't think it's something, or, or some other kind of projects, I don't think that that's really a way to resist it. Um, so I feel that this is what I mentioned is that I think that maybe first step to come to terms with that is to kind of just to try to ex kind of exaggerate it, at least in a, in a discourse, uh, just to kind of understand it better and to really kind of exaggerate it to an extreme, uh, not to accelerate, but to exaggerate it in, in our own projects and maybe st start from there. Uh, I, I know it's not a kind of hopeful or definite answer, but this is the best I can give. <laughs> Can, can we can we maybe pivot from that question to the question of agency? Because in some way, the this like like it is it is kind of like uh, uh, a clean definition of neoliberalism or the clean version of itself that kind of is constantly telling us that in some way it doesn't need us, that it would be more efficient without us, that it would be like more of this sort of. Um, um, uh, 
yeah, the kind of like pristine chain chain system. Some of the some of the critique that you had on the supply chain, um, where but yet somehow here we are, like in like underlining some residual agency or like you know poking at some kind of like agency that whether it's managerial or whether it's through through furniture or or um, a, a, a like property like more like legal uh, avenues like highlighting our you know like picking our crumbs of, of of agency or maybe you know maybe crumbs times many times it's like it's not a crumb anymore so but but it does seem like we are here sort of insisting on some certain kind of agency and since um irene you brought up the kind of second part of that question i'm also i'm kind of i'm doubling down on that if we can pivot i mean i yeah, this is kind of an impossible question because I think like architecture and architects are, it's like the most complicit, you know, I mean, it's not the most, but it's like up there in terms of just how expensive it is and it's kind of sorted relationship with power and money. Um, and so like to be a responsible citizen, it seems like the only thing you could actually do is quit architecture. Like, like reasonably like otherwise you're just like you're gonna be complicit in one way or another um and for me anyway i don't i have no idea what the answer is and where morality lies in that is a super i'm really glad you asked that frankly because that's not a question that's asked often um somehow those things are and you know like i it's probably not a healthy answer but i've largely thought of I've, I've created a pretty distinct barrier between my personal life and morality and then work because as an architect and designer, like, I mean, there's probably certain clients should I have the opportunity to design for that I would not if they were kind of morally suspect. But outside of that, like, it's a really difficult thing. And it's sort of, I agree with Matis in the sense that um something you know like this kind of myth that uh, that academia is somehow insulated from those same neoliberal forces is kind of not yeah i don't i don't buy it and then so then it's like okay so if that's not the case and there isn't really a a, a space of refuge then then how do we how do we engage in some sort of like middling way you know like if if there's no space for all out revolution then you know maybe like small like baby steps might help so if you're not evil and you're an architect maybe you can like both be moral and still have uh, an impact at scale and that's kind of the hope anyway for and why i'm thinking so much about kind of proliferation yeah. yeah. Of like the, the if I were, sorry. If I were to maybe add to that uh, briefly before you respond, Irene, I'd say that also um, sometimes refuge is sort of understood as a sort of uh, actual like physical separation of the issue. Um, sort of, um, I'm thinking of the the um, sort of socialist utopias that would uh charles Fourier, who would like move uh to the countryside and start a completely new society because they were in, they were trying to sort of criticize the existing sort of whatever structures that they didn't agree with right and they always failed because they that sort of refuge was trying to avoid the existing systems right um and i think our we can just can't avoid we can't avoid it it's around it's within us it's around us we have to sort of operate within the rules of the game, which that's absolutely inevitable. Um, but we, as much as, as, as much as can, as we can, we must use those rules of the game uh, for the proper sort of benefits or for the proper sort of uh, uses. So again, it's not about sort of isolation or completely sort of like separation, but actually sort of embracing this, uh, the system in which you exist and work and produce uh and sort of challenge it or or uh sort of crack it you know 
that makes any sense. Yeah, I was just I was just really thinking because I mean the way you guys are framing the the kind of scale agency and then neoliberalism sort of conversation is super interesting to me and because I don't think I've ever thought of it as a binary argument um, in that it's never good or bad. It's never leo neoliberalism or morality. It's not a zero sum game for me. I think my question was more geared at just the kind of nuances of all of your guys work, right? There's these nuances and these like these little moments of penetration of infiltration into into this kind of uh, really um, you know, complex and layered systems, right? We're talking about economics, politics, social, cultural, all of these different things. And I think for me, in terms of the morality question or in terms of just, uh, uh, you know, that relationship to neoliberalism, I guess I'm most interested in how your projects infiltrate, right? Infiltrate these existing systems. How do you see um, your work affecting or, or having some kind of, uh, chip in the armor or, or doing something that um, really affects how architecture currently runs. Like all of you guys have looked a lot, both, all three of you guys have really looked at, you know, these like really existing closed systems, right, that have been um, refined over decades and decades and years. And, and I guess given the changing nature of our economy, given the changing nature of our labor, given the changing nature of our governments um, where different governments are working um, it, with different uh, with the same companies so like even the way different governments are dealing with COVID I think I'm just really curious where you guys see um, the opportunities for your work and for your thinking you know to build something some kind of intention or inertia I would just jump into that and uh, just make some observations. I enjoyed very much um, all your presentations and I learned a lot. And my question, uh, following on yours on uh, opportunities for change or breakage, I was uh, very curious about the human factor or the subject of this architecture, right? I was fascin fascinated by Machi's uh, desks. Uh, the first desk with all the drawers and uh, the organization of those drawers for efficiency and the pencil and then the desk you build with nothing. And I was also um, very curious about the absence of cognitive studies, cognitive science or human agents or how the brain adapts to these. So, um, as a, as a PhD in anthropology, my colleagues in COG anthropology always had these jokes about the left brain desk and the right brain desk and how human and personality, how could you tell about humanity and personality change based on the desk, right? And I think it's so interesting that this jump into um, the digital, the internet, everything, I mean, all that research uh, is gone because everything is compacted on a virtual space and the research doesn't keep up with the pace of moving. So in terms of um, architectural agency there and breakage, what is the limit of the human into trying to put the human, feeding the human into this logic of mobile? I was, um, it made me think of my own research in Michigan, where all the migrant run organizations run backpack offices, right? And the precarization that my understanding of what an NGO should be or how an NGO should operate, basically it is the precarization of all labor, right? That needs to be up and running and mobile and uh, what does that do to human agency? Now, regarding to uh, Jacobs, I um, really liked your video game and probably as the only known architect person here, this is like a novelty for me that you can put your ideas in a video game. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, it made me thinking through my uh, planning capstones over the years here at Taubman College 
So the, the, the way architects and planners uh, that I worked with in Brazil works that they are at the service of a housing movement or a shack dweller union and they are uh, their client their clients are these organizations right and convincing them of any alternative uh, living arrangement or uh, shared kitchens that would be more efficient or bathrooms and it's a non-starter conversation right and i just uh, in bringing into uh, the video game into play i thought it was very interesting how can that in a playful way kind of um, change our imaginary of what is possible. Because of course, I wouldn't imagine to be possible to be 10 hours here today sitting in front of this laptop having all this meeting, but this uh, you know, coronavirus thing made that happen. But another way is this playful way of the video game to play with human imagination. So I was uh, just pu uh, pushing to like understanding uh, humanity and humans' capabilities and how we can use that to break with the system. And of course, the closest to my own work is um, Eduardo's work. I really liked your reading about uh, co-ops versus um, condominiums and, and the legal structure that that, um, entails right the, the, so basically you let me thinking that there is um there is a legal form that needs to follow the finance form or vice versa and there is a, a a physical form and a financial form and how these things integrated and where is the point again of breakage of the legal the, the legal form, the financial form, and the building environment form. So I, um, I really like several of the examples that you provided. And I do think that uh, these four typologies that you mentioned about financial formations are really the, basically the point where this will break, right? As you mentioned, it has the, if it is extrapolates and becomes the norm when is the point of a, a human revolution a, a, a no you know a, but yeah <laughs> i guess that's all i have to say i really enjoyed the three presentations and eduardo i would love to talk with you more about all our civil codes <laughs> and our um, legal propositions because my capstone is precisely working uh, on promoting and, and helping a social movement craft a new federal bill in Brazil that will install collective property. That is very different from this, um, of course, is very different from this uh, exhibit apartment, right? It's in contrast. <laughs> it's a type of co-housing and collective that is contra yeah. Thanks, for, uh, yeah, thanks for your, uh um, comments, uh, Ana Paula. Um, great observations of the three projects. I, if I were to try to sort of tie in your comments and uh, what also Irene was was um, talking before, I'd say that, uh, for example, uh, more specifically in, in the work that I propose in um, sort of these sort of financial formations, utilize the same instruments that I am criticizing, right? So in a way, um, by sort of exaggerating or subverting the systems that I, uh, simultaneously, I am um, sort of um, criticizing, you're able to sort of evidence the sort of limits or the deficiencies of the system while sort of simultaneously uh, proposing sort of an alternative, right? So again, um, going back to almost, um, to Irene's comment, again, it's not about um, it's not about sort of complete rejection, but sort of embracing the system to be able to sort of I don't know, mm, crack it or something, almost almost like a almost like a like a hacker uh, uh, of sorts, you know. Um, yeah. Uh... And uh, there are so many kind of uh, questions and interesting kind of uh, provocations in your response that I'm not sure if I'm, I'm able to kind of uh, <laughs> respond to all of them, Anna. 
uh, but I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the question of, of where, where is the human in, in all this? Uh, I, Honestly, I don't know. Uh, I, I I feel that just looking back at the kind of evolution of manager, management theories in business in general, right? So if you start with, let's say, if we choose to start with uh, with Taylor uh, and Taylorization, right? Uh, so workers are like uh, basically like uh, non-thinking beings and they should be organized in a way that uh, they perform the best way possible and need like very precise instructions, right? Then later, uh, human relations theory uh, comes in uh, by Mary Park and Follett by trying, trying to kind of say that humans are in the center and they should be kind of like nurtured uh, 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 to kind of like perform the best way that possible. I, I, I feel that, and, and again, this is like, this is the interesting thing that like, I don't think is different from uh, any other company than an architecture company nowadays, especially those that are like not these boutique ateliers, but those who are operating in the market, building more or less things. Um, I think that in, 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 in a way, I think, yeah, I mean, everyone is kind of uh, 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 disposable, but at the same time, there is some kind of like uh, willingness to make everyone as, as comfortable as possible. And to, again, to, but only in the name of performing as good as you can. Um, and if you look at history of architectural practices, and maybe this goes back to Lida's question and, and also Irene's question, just to kind of wrap it as well, uh, I feel that you know what are the other ways of kind of like like doing this where is the question of like morality or how can we like find our own agency in in this situation um i did a very superficial look in the at least in the us scene in the kind of more or less large architectural companies and and you can look at example of tac uh which you know they, they try to be the architects kind of you know they try to kind of be collaborative they had a, they tried to have a different model and just purely in terms of facts, they went bankrupt at some points. Uh, and, and of course, I know that there are a few people who might uh, talk about it much better than I can tonight. But for, for me, this is indicates that I think uh, it's kind of d difficult to just always kind of prioritize some kind of other ideals uh, in the current system. Um, and I think to go back to the first question by Lida, I think that I mean, yes, we, we should try to kind of uh, imagine scalable things. We should try to imagine things that could scale up and proliferate and, and produce a difference. Um, but I, I think that there are so many external circumstances that are involved in that, 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 that it's just about the right place, right time. And, and it's almost beyond our capability to fully kind of make, ensure that this happens or, or that we could imagine. Uh, uh, some other ways. However, I think that uh, precisely maybe one one way to find our agency or one way to kind of do things in our own terms is to precisely do things that do not make sense or do, in a way, our fellowship, uh, again, granted by a very kind of like a comfortable financial cushion for us so we could do these things. But b besides that, we, we, we could do things that are like not performatively measured, things that cannot be commodified. I mean, these things cannot be measured. Like, you, okay, maybe you can sell my table for $500, but that's it. Like you, you cannot, uh, it has zero market value of at least what I've done. Uh, and I think maybe that's the kind of one of the ways to find our agency. <laughs> maybe, maybe we just remove the guarantee part, which is maybe what we have to learn from this circumstance. No guarantees. Yeah. It could happen. Irene was totally like she was she was uh, nodding a lot. She was really agreeing with that, but it's <laughs> just maybe a quick. Irene wants the table. <laughs> Where do I actually? I told him I would buy it. We all want that thing. Yeah. Um, just a quick note. Uh, thanks, Anna Paula, for the comments. And I I guess I'm gonna try and thread the needle of the two like the how do you make a chink in the armor question with where are the where do people exist question um and i think the way that i would try and answer that is um the chink in the armor i guess is for me it's first understanding the the players who are most prolific in the kind of production of architecture like how are they doing it even if you think they're the kind of bane of your existence, whatever, you have to kind of know your enemy, I think. And this is something I'm really interested in and why I'm kind of looking at co-working and co-living. Not that they're my enemy necessarily, but they're very prolific, right? And obviously they have their problems and even more so now. But um, 
Yeah, that's true. I'm looking at the chats also, but um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so so that's that's super important for me to just kind of familiarize myself with that because I think if like Eduardo is saying, if there's any sort of um, maybe this is too pessimistic, but in so far, if there, uh, what I believe is that if there's any sort of capacity for change that architects can enact it it requires being a, a cog in a way in in this very complex uh, financial set of circumstances that we find ourselves in so then where people come in so like this is why it may or may not have come through in the presentation but where people come in is if the first part of my presentation is largely about understanding the ways in which co-living and co-working companies operate at scale then the second part is about, okay, if we operate in those same ways, but rethink what is being proliferated, the objects that are being placed into existing office buildings, and think about the implications of those things, because lar what these companies are doing is largely orthodox, right? It's not like a co-living or co-working space is different than um, your home most of the time, except to say that there are just more of the same things beside each other. So, um, so the, you know, like, this is why I think something like furniture design is super important is because the, the affordances of, of furniture and the way in which all kinds of assumptions are built into the way we sleep next to one another, the way that we sit next to one another, those things have real political, like I believe in the political consequences of a rectangular dining table versus a circular one, right? Like that's real, you know, one is a hierarchy, one doesn't. And maybe that's as much as architects can do, but I think that that's a big thing, right? Like, so these are, this is the kind of threading the needle. It's like chink in the armor equals knowing your enemy, uh, people equals having a progressive political position. Maybe that's all bullshit. I don't know, but that that's the hope anyway. That's well, you guys, we have voices. We have, I mean, I'm just like, it, you know, it goes beyond the object. I think that's what I see as like the real promise of your guys' work. It's not just in the object or the output, right? It's like, I feel like architects draw limits around where the agency of their work lies and all the time. And, you know, I bet Ana Paola has this less in terms of, you know, what planning does, but architects, we, we, we constantly are drawing limits around our own work because we, we, we contain it to the object. We price it within the object. We charge our fees within the object. I mean, and, and based on the kind of like real efficiencies and gains we've made in terms of industrialization and, and like the way our societies have progressed, you know, I, I'm like, I'm so into this exhibition and your guys' research because I, I really feel like the people that see this, the people that you share this with, they can take more than the object, even though I want that desk and the little squishy things. Like you can really, you know, you guys can move beyond the object and, and the things you're dealing with, like just spill out. So, I mean, that's that's where I see the real strength in it, so. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. This this is this is very very encouraging for me, at least. <laughs> I hope for uh, other positive. Are there any concluding remarks? I have a question to that point. I know we don't want to drag this on too long, but I just, I guess, uh, I would ask you if you would elaborate just on the idea because I agree completely that in a way the sort of individual object is like incidental and is constantly changing and to limit ourselves to the object proper is kind of silly or, or ineffectual. But I would then ask like, what model of practice would you point to and set of behaviors would you point to like that exists beyond the sort of realm of the object proper? That's what I was asking about the multiplier, 100%. What, are the, what is this new model? that? Of the client typology. Irene, Irene, tell us. <laughs> Lila, tell us. Anna Paula, tell us. Anna Paula, tell us. <laughs> that's what you, that's your guys' work. You're supposed to tell us what these new models are, or at least point us in the direction. Um, I think that, like, you know, I was typing to you guys in the notes that, you know, you, you were talking about players and, and just like where agency lies, like, to me, that is really at the crux of 
like what's happening in our profession and has what has been happening in our profession but again it doesn't it isn't contained within us it isn't contained within our discipline and it's not contained in the things we make and i i you know i'm going to riff on that a little bit jacob what you said i really think the object is actually really important because it 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 is still an embodiment it is it is the memorialization of a thought process of a kind of critical thinking and making that um, I think is really crucial to what architects do. You know, we jockey between abstract and we jockey between concrete. We mm -hmm. jockey between like the immediate and the very far away. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I think our ability to do that is, is really amazing. And again, to, to kind of answer this challenge, like where is that new model? You know, um, I would, I would, I would say it's with you guys. And like, again, that's probably cheesy. Like we're having a lot of these like, you know, cheesy moments, but, <laughs> um, but, but I think it's, it's in how we frame what we do and why it matters. And, and again, I know that's really stupid and, and maybe it's not stupid, but it's really simplifying the process. But I think people connect with that when you're able to simplify it on those terms. Right. Because again, there are, um, I think the people that do it well is, are people that are able to accumulate a lot of different objects around an intention or some kind of engagement with the world that they're proposing, right? And so if we look at a commercial example of that, I would say Apple, right? They're like hugely successful in packaging. And I know it's just a marketing ploy, but like think different. It, it packages everything from computers to software, to movies, to television, to uh, payment, software, how we use money, like that we don't use cash anymore. I mean, all of that's being affected by a company like Apple. And I, and I do think architects um, in general, like when you start thinking outside of, you know, I've always loved Laura Kurgan's project, you know, the million dollar blocks. And it, you know, maybe it's not necessarily true, but linking sort of prison imprisonment with the kind of localities of how people were raised on their blocks and the kind of infrastructures and uh, mon monetary support that they had at that level. Again, I think where we're able to make those connections with things we make, make the connections with the ideas that we have and the observations we have about like, um, and I say this a lot in my class, but defects and deficiencies in our existing systems, I think those then get transformed into opportunities. And um, from the safety of academia, which is an awesome place, I think we have the opportunity to propose or at least like push, push things a little bit in a different direction. And then I would say from the, you know, the trenches of practice, that's where you really can get like very up close and personal with those deficiencies and with those defects, right? So I think all of us have the luxury of being able to kind of jockey between those two realms, especially I know because, uh, and I'm speaking of the three of you, you guys, you know, definitely have a strong interest in practice, you know, beyond, um, beyond simply, uh, you know, transitioning from practice into academia. But, you know, I myself played the hokey pokey and I, and I think it really is, it's, it's a really interesting place to be and, and we can do that. So, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, maybe That's to add into, to that, I'd say precisely to be able to sort of um, take opportunity or chance of the deficiencies of the system, you have to understand the system. Like, and you have to understand that there is a system, right? That there are, and that's pr precisely the ethos of this whole exhibition, immaterial protocols that govern the production of these, what we're calling objects, right? Sort of the physical uh, sort of representation, the material representation of, of all of these things, right? Um, and I think that's, that's something that sort of has come across all of our work, the three of us, that we sort of acknowledge that um, all of these, say spatial products, whatever they are, uh, offices, uh, uh, living furniture, buildings, whatever, or cities, they always depart from uh, a immaterial sort of abstract system that you have to at least understand. And that I'd say that tying almost to that sort of question of morality, it's our obligation as architects today to understand and, uh, those systems. Uh, and uh, include them as part of our sort of uh, sort of expertise, you know.
And it's not natural for our profession to do that because as you know, Jacob mentioned, it's really like we're fully ingrained and fully enmeshed in these, and, and your work as well, Eduardo, is that we're fully enmeshed in these economic systems and efficiencies that are not subject to moral concerns, right? And, and, and again, what is the place of architecture, right? What is the place of our profession? Are we charged with a morality or are we not? Like, is it our job to do that? Is it, you know, what is our social responsibility? And again, you know, I think that really is a question of our, you know, that also challenges our own privilege and our own relationship to the work and the, prof and, and the discipline and, and the profession and how we are able to do it. So, I mean, I, I'm so, ooh. I'm so curious how you guys are are moving through all that. So, uh, we'll on that note, yeah. Sorry. Are there any other concluding remarks? I just want to say thanks to you three so much for coming. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. me too. Yeah, and you're, you're, so it's this really a pleasure, and we really appreciate it. Um, the thumbs up and all. Yeah, it's great. Um, Not even. Always, always wishing that this kinds of things could have a, yeah, more seamless. You know, yeah, that this could be more seamless so that the conversation could be somewhat like. <laughs> keep, yeah, just keep keep yeah. at yeah. it. For, Thank you. For a while. Thank you so much. We should do like a later conversation after this conversation to kind of follow up on this conversation uh, in a way. <laughs> I, I feel yeah. Can we email each other? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I invite all of you to kind of uh, stick around because we have like one uh, last question from the chat box on YouTube from our uh, viewers. And I think it's a long one. Uh, but I think, I, I think it's kind of an interesting one. And it's a nice way to kind of wrap this up. Um, so I'm not going to read the whole, the whole question because it's quite, uh, quite long. But basically, long story short, you know, we have our own kind of like values and USA uh, have, has like values of regarding how one is to live and, and what is the kind of normative way of living. Uh, and then at the same time, you know, quite often large shifts in behavior and values can only occur uh, slowly or a result of some kind of like large scale uh, cataclysm. So the question is, uh, you know, what model do you imagine uh, could change the kind of uh, situation or, or like change the kind of perception of uh, what's the normative uh, idea of living uh, in the US. What model do you imagine will cause this change? I think that the, um, it's, I don't think that the model would cause a change. I think that the model responds to a, to a change. Um, I think that uh, there's, again, you have to, going back to the whole sort of conversation we've been having, you sort of have to respond to sort of uh, the rules of the game of whatever the systems are sort of offering you and work with that. Um, the idea that a sort of a complete new model could sort of revamp everything, uh, sort of that sort of positivistic sort of attitude, it's something that uh, I think we're sort of agreeing here that is not the solution. Well, maybe it's also a question to all, everyone uh, present at this stage. I mean, maybe to make it more kind of uh, 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 provocative, like, do you think that the kind of current uh, situation in which we find ourselves in uh, globally would kind of produce some kind of maybe new new sense of uh, collectivity and, and, and some kind of change of perception of how we should live in general? Or you think it's just going to uh, uh, fade? I mean, I guess I'm of the belief that the sort of current crises is 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 only surfacing existing crises. It's not necessarily sort of creating new ones. They're they, they were underlining to begin with, and they're just now highlighted. And I don't know. I don't know. I I, I can't really tell what it's going to produce. I think it's going to produce probably a new a new class system, a probably a more divided one. And within those two class systems, there there will be some new sort of like um, modes, modes of living. I don't know what collectivity um, will look like, I, especially when you incorporate a kind of digital consideration where physical togetherness might not be as um, encouraged or easy. I, uh, that, 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 that part I don't um, really know, but I think it will, I think it will create, create 
clustering perhaps rather than collectivity I, I, I would maybe put that as a as a polemic clustering versus collectivity potentially yeah i would say it's totally up for grabs and i just have a quick anecdote about that which is you know i've got like three weeks of toilet paper left and i'm pretty excited about that and <laughs> I just want you to know that I was talking to my neighbor down the street and she had a gigantic pack of, of Costco toilet paper and she left a six, six roll pack for me, which is really generous. Whereas, you know, when I went to the hardware store where I thought I was kind of gaming the system a couple of weeks ago, they'd already sold out of toilet paper, but I thought that was a good place to go. Um, but, you know, they're, they're telling me that there are people buying like 80, 90 packs of toilet paper which is enough for you know a year and a half of, of that. So I think Lida's answer is is really it 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 it, it, it illustrates or it kind of personifies just how up for grabs all of that is. You know, I think the hope is that it it has some sort of effect like World War One where you know everyone is banded against the enemy, right? But because people are so because people now can find community in such different ways, you know, and there's such a multitude of different opinions and different um, ways of slicing a particular fact or event into, into so many different ways. You know, I think that's the kind of new multiplicity that we're dealing with that is so complex. It almost is beyond like our more concrete, less abstract thinking, our kind of, you know, older, biological cells so I don't know I think it's a great question and I, yeah. I you know you know I also think that um, the kind of presentation the three of you did today understanding the system and how the system works is very important at the moment because our uh, sentiment is just to take care of the immediate humanitarian need that this is caused. But thinking, you know, keeping in mind the systemic failures of healthcare, the systemic failures of housing, of the financi financialization of these processes and uh, the exploitation of labor, precarization of labor is super important. Because I think it will be in our memories forever that we had this time and that things happened like $1,200 checks for everyone, no one gets evicted. So I think these acts will ingrain in our uh, collective memory as possibilities of relief, as possibilities of what the state can do, but also our failures are more evident than ever before, the failures of our health system of our lack of coordination. So I would hope that in, for the three of you that are fellows that focus so much on revealing to us how the system works, and I learned a lot from your presentations, I think that this is more needed than ever so we don't get caught into, you know, the immediate need, but we can think more systemically in ways that we can, that, that this can impact us in the long run can change things in the long run. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that that's a very beautiful kind of conclusion, a very hopeful, uh, a very hopeful conclusion, uh, I hope. And uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to, I guess it's, I think it's time to wrap up uh, this session. Uh, thanks to everyone who was watching us on, on, on YouTube. Uh, and thanks for all the questions. I hope we covered all of them and we really appreciated your response. Uh, this was definitely an experiment and we, a few months ago, we intended this night to go on in a very different uh, way that it did tonight. But nonetheless, I'm so happy that uh, Anna Paula, Irene and Lida could join us and we could all come together even in this kind of like decentralized way to uh, 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 talk about uh, the project and ideas. And I, I also really hope that uh, uh, sooner or later we can all meet again in person and, and, and just talk about this or whatever else, uh, because it's always a pleasure. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks again to everyone. Thanks again to McLean. Thanks again to the Common College uh, for this. Thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. All around. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully you can eventually see the show. It's, it's, yeah.
It'll be fun. Yeah, the show's gonna be there. The the material representation of the show is is there, and hopefully one day you'll be able to uh, walk into it. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, for the effort and for your time. It's been really amazing. Uh, Congratulations, guys! It was amazing. Thanks, thanks, thanks for making sure we were able to experience it, if not in full life, at least, you know, in the best way you guys could deliver it, and that yeah. takes a lot. So thanks so much. Thank yeah. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. The best. You killed them, my friends. Bye. Thanks. Good night. Ciao, ciao. Uh, bye. Bye. Oh, bye. <laughs> sad. So sad. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Wait. Let's just stay. <laughs> we're just gonna like hang on to the end because we're too sad to leave. Damn, Mattis is the host. If Mattis is gone, it's just like anarchy now. I don't know. He Mattis looks like he's still CV there. His face is still on there. I think that's Mattis's CV. Oh wait, this could be like the outtakes. We could like do something. <laughs> this is yeah. like the end this of the is, movie. This is the <laughs> <director's cut. laughs> I feel like I would be like Adam Sandler or something. In this <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, right. uh, yeah. cool. Goodbye. All right. Talk soon. Bye bye. Good night.